It has been said that as much as 30% of this book, the Bible, is prophecy. For example, Jesus himself said on multiple occasions, and now I have told you before it comes to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. In other words, he tells us in advance. The evidence that scripture gives that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah is prophecy. How can we know that Jesus existed at all? Well, we turn to history, historians from that time period. Historians weren't even Christians who wrote about a man called Jesus. Tacitus is one of those historians. He wrote in his work, Annals, around AD 115, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And Tacitus was referred to as the greatest historian of ancient Rome. Now, there were others that referred to Jesus and his followers. Josephus, a Jewish historian, also mentioned Jesus in, in reference to the trial of James, the brother of Jesus. In his work, Antiquities, which was only written about 60 years after Jesus died, about between AD 90 and 95, he wrote, so he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ. So we have ancient sources, non-biblical sources, that specifically tell us that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Tacitus, Josephus, and many others tell us that he was a real historical figure. This being the case, the question is not, did Jesus of Nazareth exist, but rather, was he who he claimed to be? Was he the Christ, the Savior of the world? When it comes to the prophecies of Jesus, one of the most remarkable things is what takes place when you take those prophecies of Jesus and you work them out mathematically. Now there has been a mathemati mathematician who's done that. Peter Stoner, famous mathematician, went in, looked at how many prophecies there were, 300 prophecies. And then as he broke down those prophecies, he said, let me just take eight of them and figure out what's the likelihood of eight of these prophecies being fulfilled in one person's life. So Professor Stoner gives us an illustration. It helps us to understand the nature of probability. So let's just say that one in every 10 men that you meet has a bald head. And one in every 100 men that you meet happen to have a missing finger. You want to find out how many men are there that I'm going to bump into that actually have a missing finger and a bald head. So what you do is you multiply the first two figures and then you have your answer. One in every 1,000 men that you meet are going to actually have a missing finger and a bald head. Peter Stoner presented his class with a challenge. The class was to look at the Bible and try to find all the prophecies regarding the coming of Christ to see what was the probability that one man could come out of all the men that existed in the, in the history of the world and yet fulfill exactly every single prophecy. One of the prophecies that Peter W. Stoner mentions is Zechariah 9.9 which reads, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. The question is, is how many people in Earth's history have been kings? And of those individuals, how many have ridden on a donkey into Jerusalem? Well, I don't know. Neither did the class, so they decided to assign an absurdly high number. They decided one out of every 100 men who ever lived rode into Jerusalem as a king on a donkey of all things. I mean one in a hundred. This is obviously absurdly high, but that's the point. Stoner effectively buffered his calculations and thus his conclusions against objections that he had biased his calculations to favor Jesus' identification as the Messiah. Another prophecy that Professor Stoner looked at was Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. In Micah 5 verse 2, there's an incredible prophecy that is given hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, pinpointing exactly the place where Jesus would be born. It states, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. What's amazing is the fact that there are two Bethlehems, two cities called Bethlehem in Israel, one in the northern portion of the kingdom, one in the south. Uh, this specifies which Bethlehem. 
that specifies Bethlehem Ephrata, which is Bethlehem in Judah. So the prophecy is very precise. But in addition to that, when you think about Mary and Joseph, uh, Mary finds out that she's pregnant. She's in Nazareth. And yet suddenly this decree comes out, this census is being proclaimed by the Romans. And they're told that they have to go back to the birthplace of the husband. And so Joseph makes his way to Bethlehem in Ephrata. They have to take their family back to Bethlehem. Joseph has to be taxed according to Roman law. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. The prophecy fulfilled right to the very, very place where Micah, hundreds of years earlier, predicted it to, be, to happen was just remarkable when you think about all the circumstances involved. So Stoner and his students, they decided that they wanted to figure out in the light of the world's population, how many people have actually been born in the city of Bethlehem? One out of every 280,000 people was a very conservative estimate that they made, that they found mathematically, of how many people have actually been born in Bethlehem. Now another prophecy they looked at is found in the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Stoner brings this out, that Jesus was a just man, condemned to die, and he said not a word, not one word in his defense. Now how many have done that? Well, his class didn't know. Of course not, how could you know? So here again, they assigned a conservatively high number. For the purposes of their calculations, they said, okay, how about one in every thousand men who ever lived were both wrongly accused of a crime and during their trial chose to speak no word in their defense? And then as he broke down those prophecies, he said, let me just take eight of them and figure out what's the likelihood of eight of these prophecies being fulfilled in one person's life. So just with those eight prophecies, he said the probability of one person fulfilling all eight was one in 10 to the power of 17. That's like taking silver dollars all over Texas. They covered the entire state. And on one of those coins, somewhere in the state, you have a particular coin marked with a black X. And you put, put it randomly, stir it up somehow, and randomly put it somewhere in the state of Texas, covered two feet deep with these silver dollars, and you send a blind man in. The probability that he would just wander the state of Texas, reach down on his first try, and come up with this marked silver dollar is the probability that one man could fulfill all eight of these prophecies about Jesus. Now, not only that, but it actually, he went further and he said, all right, let me see if I take 48 of these, 48 out of the 300, okay? What's the probability that one man in the history of the world could fulfill just 48 of these prophecies? And the number was a staggering one man out of one with 157 zeros after it. That number is so big, just to give you an idea, Scientists have determined that there are only one with 80 zeros after it, atoms, in the entire universe. That's not just our, our planet or our solar system or our galaxy, but the entire universe only has one with 80 zeros after it. There's not even enough atoms in the universe in order to hold that number. Now, this answers the question about some people say, well, you know, maybe a lot of people have met these prophecies. Maybe it's not just, uh, you, you know, Jesus, that you could have a whole bunch of people who meet all of these prophecies, but that's just not possible. It's so mind-boggling. It's so impossible, and that's not even close to the probability of what it would be to fulfill 48, which is one with 157 zeros after it. Staggering. Staggering. That's only 48 prophecies. There are 300. What you've got in here is you've got something so remarkable that the whole universe can hold it. In fact, this is what Peter Stoner said. He said, any man who rejects Christ as the Son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. 
It's one thing to analyze a number of prophecies that specifically talk about the life and character of Christ, but what if there was a prophecy that made all of these other prophecies date sensitive? Meaning, what if there was a prophecy that specifically told us when all of these prophecies would have to be fulfilled? That prophecy we find in Daniel chapter 9. Here in Daniel chapter 9, we are given a fascinating prophecy hundreds of years before the time of Jesus that pinpoints the exact time of when the Messiah would be anointed. We have here the most precise prophecy about the Messiah in terms of when the Messiah would come of anywhere in the Old Testament. Reading here in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now what does that mean? That word for week in Hebrew can either mean weeks of days or it can mean weeks of years. Daniel recognizes the same thing in his prophecies, that one day is a year. Therefore, he knows that in this 70 weeks is 70 weeks of years, which means 490 years. The way it works is like this. There are 490 years. We need to find the starting point. That's the key. In Daniel 9.25, it says that the starting date was from the decree that would restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Then Messiah would come onto the stage of human affairs. So we find the starting date. We go forward into the future, 483 years, and we have found the date in which the Messiah is supposed to begin His work on planet Earth. The beginning date of the seven-week prophecy is obviously 457 B.C. Now, there are some other decrees that have gone out at this time, but this is the one that invokes God accomplishing it. So we know that this is the beginning date, 457 B.C. All right, if you take 457 B.C., and now you come forward 483 years, what do you get? 27 A.D. As the time when, according to Daniel 9, the Messiah would come. What does that mean? The prophecies are about a Messiah, but what is Messiah? The Hebrew people wouldn't know what that means, but what does that mean to us? The word Messiah comes from a Hebrew verb which means to anoint. So Messiah is anointed, and in ancient times that was the way someone was marked for office. So the question arises, was Jesus of Nazareth anointed in AD 27? The Messiah appears and becomes the anointed one precisely at that point in AD 27 as Daniel prophesied in Daniel 9. What does that mean? He would begin his ministry. He would appear in that year. Well, what happened in 27 A.D.? Luke chapter 3, verse 1. Luke 3, verse 1 says that in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and then it goes on to describe Jesus' baptism. The 15th year of Tiberius happened to also be the date of A.D. 27, the exact year when Jesus Christ was baptized. So we have the Jordan River and we have John baptizing. Jesus comes to John and John baptizes Jesus. Now the word baptize comes from the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo means to emerge, to dip. It was a term widely used as in the immersion of dyes and cloth, that they would fully take that cloth and immerse it in that dye, completely covering it. So Jesus was completely submerged and brought out. And when he was brought out, the light from God shone upon him and the Holy Spirit descended on him as a dove. And that is when Jesus, the Messiah, was anointed. And so we can clearly see that there's a shadow of a doubt that nearly 500 years before the event took place, it was predicted and fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is baptized immediately after he's baptized and John the Baptist confesses that he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus goes to preach his first sermon. He says, the time is fulfilled for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So when Jesus came and proclaimed the time is fulfilled, 
what he is indicating is that Daniel's great prophetic time clock has struck the zero hour. It is time for the Messiah to arrive. It's fascinating enough that the Bible tells us when the Messiah would be anointed, but the Bible even goes further to tell us the year when the Messiah would be crucified. Daniel 9 predicted precisely when Jesus would come as Messiah. Now there were some people in the early Christian age who didn't like the fact that so many people were becoming Christians because of this passage. In certain Jewish literature, they have a curse on you who study, some, study this prophecy because I think it's very powerful evidence pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. And they were very threatened by this passage because it was too overwhelming that it pinpointed the individual who was supposed to come to the very year. Now what happens in the rest of the passage? What does it say? The prophecy of Daniel 9 tells us that in the middle of that week, in other words, about three and a half years, into the last week or seven years of Daniel's 70-week prophecy, the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. So three and a half years after the baptism, the anointing of the Messiah, he would be cut off at the end of the sacrifices would happen. Three and a half years after AD 27 brings us to the spring of AD 31. AD 31, the spring of AD 31, and particularly the, the Passover in the spring of AD 31, would be the Passover at which Jesus was crucified. And how significant it is, we discover that after a ministry of about three and a half years, Jesus was crucified in the spring at Passover time of the year AD 31. In other words, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, was sacrificed for our sins just at the same time of the year that the Passover lamb was sacrificed. The word cutoff in Hebrew is karat. And this verb karat is used of a divine penalty for sinners back in the books of Moses, particularly Leviticus, Numbers, and so on. It's a divine penalty that God himself would administer. It's not simply capital punishment, but it's like a, a death beyond death. It's like a second death. There is accountability that goes to the afterlife. The person who's cut off doesn't get an afterlife. It's like a, a second death, a death that goes beyond death. All right, well, now we understand the background, but here we have in Daniel 9, 26, the Messiah. It uses that word Mashiach, from which we get the English word Messiah. When Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he was beginning to experience this sundering, this separating from his Father, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to the point of death. In other words, my soul is dying. And he's going to be cut off, suffer this terrible penalty? What kind of sin has he done? How could this be? Well, there's only one explanation. You've got to put it with Isaiah 53. He doesn't die for his own sins. He dies for the sins of his people. This is not an ordinary death, a first death. This is a second death. The, uh, the final moments of Christ's life on earth were quite tragic. Uh, his friend uh, betrayed him, Judas. One of Jesus' own followers, Judas Iscariot, betrayed Jesus uh, for the sum of 30 pieces of silver. It's amazing to think that Zechariah had predicted precisely that it would be 30 pieces of silver, and that's exactly what Judas received for betraying Christ. He uh, regretted his bargain rather immediately and tried to give the money back, uh, and then went out and killed himself. So keep in mind that the prophecy says that in AD 31, that the Messiah would be cut off or he would be crucified. So. Jesus, knowing this, understood that his life would be a mechanism that would offer salvation to the world. Therefore, he was willing to do anything to accomplish his mission. He was beaten a number of times, uh, as much as possible, that was legal, without actually killing somebody, as with skin being torn out of his, his body with each whip. Then after this, uh, he had to carry his cross but that didn't last because uh, he was already, yeah, I'm sure he had a lot of blood loss because of the uh, scourging. Crucifixion inflicted by the Romans was the most horrible punishment that anybody could go through at the time. 
It was a type of torture that is to bring death, but a slow death. People were impaled on a cross or on a pole. They were, nails were put through their hands and through their feet. The feet would have been placed together. The nail would have gone one single nail through both feet, nailing those. Tendría que alzarse en cada respiro sobre esos pies a fin de permitir que su diagrama se extendiera. Además, la sangre quemaba por dentro. Una sensación de incendio por el efecto que la crucifixión causaba en el cuerpo. Y era una tortura sobreviniente en etapas. Era una sofocación, era la sangre quemando, era la sed que iban sintiendo. Así que era exactamente eso, tortura y luego al final la muerte. Por supuesto, la muerte de Jesús no por fuerza de la crucifixión, no fue por asfixia. Tras colgar en la cruz por varios días, no fue la muerte por pérdida de sangre. No fue una muerte causada por la tortura física que sufrió Jesús. La manera que su muerte no fue por un sufrimiento físico, sino murió de un corazón quebrantado. El síndrome de corazón quebrantado es un término médico en el cual el corazón sufre tanta tensión que parece que la persona está sufriendo un paro cardíaco, aunque no haya, conclusión, aunque no haya oclusión física en la arteria. Más bien, son los niveles elevados de tensión que pueden hacer que el cuerpo, más bien son los niveles elevados de tensión que pueden hacer que el cuerpo reaccione tal que haya una deformidad física como lo es el síndrome de corazón quebrantado. La presión emocional fue increíble. La presión porque si él abandonaba la lucha, la salvación final no se realizaría. El síndrome de corazón quebrantado es también conocido como la enfermedad de Takosubo. Incluso, Takosubo es una trampa en forma de pulpo y el corazón queda en esa forma cuando está sufriendo el daño. Los pacientes que sufren esa miocardiopatía, eso sucede en pacientes que están sufriendo un nivel de estrés extraordinario. Esto no es una presión menor, por lo cual Jesús, muriendo en la cruz, tenía sobre sus hombros toda la culpabilidad y los pecados del mundo entero. Y la carga de angustia mental que estaba sufriendo bien pudo ser causa del síndrome. Y las sustancias químicas elevadas bajo esta tremenda presión hubieran provocado eso. Isaías 53, 6 dice, Mas Jehová cargó en él el pecado de todos nosotros. Y de ese pronóstico siglos antes de la crucifixión, se nos informa que la muerte de Jesús no sería resultado de los sucesos físicos, sino la separación de su Padre y más allá la carga del pecado de todo el mundo que desgarró su corazón. Y Él lo pagó allí en la cruz. Y aunque sufra el ser cortado porque no fue para sí mismo, triunfa sobre la muerte de donde no había escapatoria y nos da salvación y esperanza. Una cosa imprescindible. Y la profecía de Daniel 9.27 dice que haría cesar los sacrificios y las ofrendas. ¿Cuándo se cumplió? Tres años y medio después del 27, nos trae a la primavera del 31 después de Cristo. Y a la mitad de esa última semana de, de años, Jesús murió. ¿Hizo cesar el sacrificio y la ofrenda? Depende de qué quieres decir. Cuando uno pecaba, tenía que traer un sacrificio. Se permitía ofrecer diferentes animales. Era un sustituto que se ofrecía por uno. Jesús fue el cumplimiento de esos sacrificios y símbolos. Y es por eso que Juan el Bautista dijo, He aquí el Cordero de Dios que quita el pecado del mundo. Y no vamos nosotros a un santuario hebreo, vamos por fe a la cuesta del Calvario donde el Hijo de Dios muere por nosotros, y como dice la Escritura, Dios lo hizo a Él, 
el pecado por todos nosotros para que la justicia de Dios se cumpliese en nosotros. La muerte de Cristo a la mitad de semana, en la primavera del 31 después de Cristo, es sin duda alguna la evidencia sólida más significativa que Jesucristo es realmente el Salvador del mundo que fue predicho. Es que es increíble pensar que murió al momento predicho en la forma que la Biblia predijo. Es una profecía de Daniel escrita siglos antes, escrita en el siglo VI, prediciendo precisamente eso, la muerte de Cristo. Esto fue en medio de la última semana de años, que fue entre el 27 después de Cristo y el 34 después de Cristo. ¿Qué sucede en el 34 después de Cristo al final de los 490 años? Eso fue lo que ocurre en Hechos capítulo 7. En el capítulo 7, Esteban era un diácono lleno del Espíritu Santo. Estaba evangelizando y hubo quienes lo reportaron a las autoridades y fue arrestado, dio un increíble discurso, luego lo mataron a pedradas al final del plazo. El evangelio fue rechazado por los líderes del pueblo del pacto y fue ofrecido a los gentiles por el apóstol Pablo en cumplimiento de la profecía del Antiguo Testamento. En Hechos 15 vemos que la separación es quebrantada. Gentiles, personas como yo, podemos ir directamente a Cristo sin hacernos judíos primero. Podemos ir a Él. Judíos pueden acudir, hindúes y musulmanes y todos los demás pueblos. Todos podemos acudir directamente a Él y ser descendientes espirituales de Abraham. Es una profecía 500, 600 años antes de los sucesos y que describe con exactitud el ministerio de Cristo, su muerte, la destrucción de Jerusalén. Increíble. La Biblia no solo nos da hasta el año que vendría y daría su ministerio. Nos dice dónde nace, la tribu de dónde provendría. En total es algo que no se pudo manipular. Tuvo que ser conocimiento divino, previo, revelado y profetizado aquí en Miqueas, en Daniel y en las otras profecías, señalando la naturaleza de su obra, lo que realizaría, cómo iba a morir, todo este sinnúmero de cosas y todo, todo se junta para mostrarnos que Dios sabe lo que hace, que podemos tener confianza, que al decir que nos libraría, que Él lo puede, más es la resurrección que lo sella todo y nos da poderosas, poderosas razones para creer en el plan conjunto de la salvación revelado en el Nuevo Testamento. Se ha dicho que Jesucristo fue el más grande personaje de la historia. Sin sirvientes, más le llamaban Señor. Sin licenciatura, le llamaban profesor. Sin medicinas, le llamaban médico. Sin ejército, más los reyes le temían. No ganó campaña militar, más conquista el mundo. Sin cometer delito, más le crucificaron. Fue sepultado en una tumba, más vive es este día. Al pensar atrás y ver qué fue lo que me ayudó a ser cristiano, fue Cristo Jesús. Y al descubrir esas profecías siendo un jovencito de 15 años de una familia secular, asistiría a un seminario de Daniel y descubrir que Jesús, que Jesús llegó al tiempo predicho, murió al tiempo predicho, y ahora tenía ante mí toda la evidencia. ¿Qué haría yo? Este Cristo se me comprobó sin duda alguna que este Jesús había venido. Al yo ver todo esto en la historia y en el mundo actual, puedo tener la seguridad como cristiano que la Biblia es la palabra de Dios. El gobernador romano Poncio Pilato se despierta esa mañana y no tiene idea, ni la menor idea, lo que va a enfrentar ese día. Y lo que termina encontrándose es el rostro mismo de Cristo Jesús. Sea no lo que él esperaba, eso fue lo que enfrentó. Lo mismo nos pasa a nosotros. Despertamos en la mañana y no esperamos que hoy podría ser el día que me encuentre con la evidencia, que me diga que necesito un Salvador y que Cristo Jesús fue realmente el Mesías. Ahora tenía que decidir mi respuesta. Y al examinar toda la información, 
Si Jesús realmente existe, si desea una relación conmigo, necesito conocer más de Él y ver de qué se trata. Y creo que no hay nada más importante. Es el deber más importante. Cada quien le conviene estudiar este asunto. Escudriñar las Escrituras por sí mismo. Y fue así que iniciaría el proceso. Y al leer mi Biblia y al leer los Evangelios, la Biblia se hizo viviente y descubrí esa relación y mi vida no ha sido la misma. Jesús está de pie ante Pilato. Y Pilato le hace una pregunta cínica y dice, ¿qué es la verdad? Y con toda certeza es una de las grandes ironías de la historia. Pilato inquiere, ¿qué es la verdad? Mejor hubiese sido la pregunta, ¿quién es la verdad? Pues el único que en todas las edades de la historia humana aseveró ser la personificación de la verdad, estaba allí, enfrente de ella. Y Pilato, puesto que era inducido por la opinión pública, era esclavo de la opinión pública. No se predispuso a saber la respuesta. La pregunta es, ¿estamos nosotros, a diferencia de Pilato, dispuestos a saber justamente qué es la verdad? My grandfather was a Christian pastor in Germany. He always said he was born on the wrong side of the ocean at the wrong time of history. Uh, he was drafted into the German army along with every able-bodied person right as the Second World War began in 1939 and uh, immediately placed on a frontline unit, Unit 699, that was placed in the heart of Russia and moving through the Ukraine and into Russia in the southern flank They were heading for the city of Baku, for their goal was to basically capture the oil reserves of the Russian armies and the Russian government. And uh, being on a bridge building unit right at the front lines, often behind enemy lines, there were huge amounts of casualties and, and a lot of, lot of heartache. One day, his commanding officer towards the end of the war called him into his office, his makeshift office, and asked him a very direct question. He said, Herr Hazel, do you believe that Germany is going to win this war? And the question was kind of a catch-22, because if you're a patriotic soldier, you're going to say, of course we're going to win this war. But also being a Bible student and as pastor and having studied prophecy, my grandfather knew that, that Germany would not win the war, and so he was conflicted, and he didn't know exactly what to say, and at that moment he said a silent prayer to heaven, And then he said, is this an official or an unofficial question? They had kind of an unwritten code within their unit that when they had their hats off, 
they could speak on an unofficial capacity. And so the commanding officer stopped for a moment and then he said, okay, it's unofficial. And he took off his hat and placed it on his desk and my grandfather did the same. And he pulled out a Bible from his pocket, opened it up to Daniel chapter 2 and began to tell the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he said, well, I don't believe that Hitler is correct. His empire cannot last a thousand years as he's promising the German people. This war has to fail because of biblical prophecy and how everything has been fulfilled in the past. Nearly 2,500 years ago, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream. Now it's been said that this dream revealed the history of Earth from that time until today. Now is this actually true? In order to find out, we need to go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel was taken captive about 605 BC, according to the book. He was taken captive right about the beginning of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar II, who uh, established the resurgence of Babylon as a very strong power in the ancient Near East. He took a number of princes from the city of Jerusalem captive, one of whom was Daniel. It was, it was not unusual that conquerors, kings who conquered the land, would take from royal families and nobility young people and take them with them to their own country. And it was mainly done for two reasons. One reason is that these young people will be educated in Babylon. And they would accept not only language of Babylonians, but they would accept culture and religion and everything from Babylon. They would take the cream of the crop, the intelligentsia, the royalty. Uh, they would take the artisans, the, the writers, the physicians, so that their land was um, developed at a high level. But they would leave some of the people uh, in the land and allow a local person to rule. That's exactly what happened with the time of Daniel. Daniel and his friends were taken from Jerusalem to Babylonia. We find Daniel captive in Babylon. Now, Daniel chapter 1 tells us why he's there, okay? Nebuchadnezzar had gone to Jerusalem in three separate raids. The first one was in 605 B.C. Then there was another one around 598 B.C. and another one around 586 B.C. Each time, the penalty against the people of Jerusalem was a little bit more severe. It may have been in that initial attack in 605 when Daniel and his friends, princes of the kingdom, were taken into captivity with the idea of training them and making them sympathetic supporters of the Babylonian crown. This piece chronicles events from 605 to 594 BC, including Nebuchadnezzar's campaign into Palestine and the first capture of Jerusalem. Daniel was probably brought back to Babylon on the first raid by Nebuchadnezzar. He comes to Babylon and he is enrolled in the schools of the Babylonians. He's given a Babylonian name, he's fed Babylonian food. He is enrolled in their schools in a kind of Babylonian brainwashing to prepare him to assimilate to Babylonian culture and language and eventually to be a kind of puppet ruler over the Jews for the Babylonian Empire. He risked his life by insisting on remaining pure in the way that he ate in his diet and so on and what he drank rather than just accepting the hospitality of the king. Now that was extraordinarily dangerous and if you don't accept the hospitality that is a serious insult. Now you see that can be dangerous even if you're equals with somebody but Daniel was not the e equal with Nebuchadnezzar. He was a captive. He was being treated with a massive blessing and compliment from the king the great king who had conquered all these other kingdoms, and yet he refused his hospitality? This was very dangerous, but God blessed him, he got through that, and he became much wiser than all of the other uh, wise men. One of the most fascinating stories in the Bible is the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Ch Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has dreams, the Bible says. It was his second year of his reign, and uh, he wakes up completely disturbed because he's had this amazing dream, and like something that happens to so many of us. He wakes up and he doesn't remember what he dreamed. He dreamt a dream that terrified the daylights out of him. Now, this has got to be quite a dream to terrify this kind of a king. He knows it's from the gods. He's just conquered all this territory, but it still frightens him. He doesn't know what it means. Obviously, to him, 
as many other people in the Near East thought, as well as Pharaoh in the book of Genesis, he thought this had something to do with him and his future and his kingdom, but he didn't know what. And what's more, in the morning he had that impression, but he forgot what the details of the dream were, so he couldn't even remember it. It's fascinating. When you look at archaeological evidence, tablets that have been dug up from 6th century Babylon, we find that dreams were a common part of Babylonian existence, you know, particularly among the priestly class, among uh, the elite class. Uh, there was a whole school of how to deal with dreams. They had books on how to interpret and define dreams. So that actually, that description of the king having a dream and having someone come in to interpret it fits right in with the 6th century context. The greatest attested genre of Babylonian literature that we have is divination literature, omens like that. In other words, what I'm saying is that if you took all of the Babylonian written materials that we have and you put them all together in a library, the biggest section would be this one. Babylon is steeped in religious meaning, connotations, overtones, undertones, and that's the world that, that Daniel lived in, and this is the context in which Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. He was filled, his, his life was filled with symbolism, and so for him to have received a dream that was so symbolic would have really meant something significant to him. He would have realized this is more than just an un, you know, a strange dream. It has meaning. If a dream was not interpreted, it was perceived as dangerous or it was perceived as a curse. That's why people had to fight for finding the interpretation of the dream. So therefore he called all of his wise men who were supposed to deal with dreams and visions and interpreting them and omens and divination and all that stuff. Um, and they were the ones who, who knew about the gods and how to get in touch with them. So he calls them all together. For some reason Daniel wasn't there. We don't know exactly why. Maybe they just neglected to call him because he's a, a young colleague of the rest of them. Um, we don't know. Maybe there was some politicking going on. Maybe some of the others were jealous and didn't want to call him. All right, so Nebuchadnezzar has all of these people and, he's, and he says, all right, I've had this dream and I want you to tell me the interpretation. So they say, oh, that's, that's fine. We're in that business. Tell us the dream. Oh no, I don't remember the dream. You're gonna tell me what the dream is. And he goes so far as to say, I have decided firmly, if you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. He is demanding of these wise men that they tell the king the content of the dream. And they get upset. They know they're going to die if uh, they don't do this. And uh, so they're really working hard against this. And you know what they do? They say, as it says there in Daniel, now wait a minute, king. They're fighting for the lives now. There is no king on earth that would ever ask such a difficult question. The king basically says, I'm not going to be persuaded by your time-saving tactics, okay? If you tell me what the dream is, then I can have confidence in your interpretation. I don't remember what the dream was, and that's what I need you to do for me. After all, you're the magicians, you're the astrologers, you're the soothsayers, tell me the dream. They were paid, they were enrolled, they were uh, on the divine payroll for the purpose of knowing what others didn't know. They had access to secret information. And so it was reasonable for the king to ask this. And so the king decides that he's going to have them all killed. All of his top advisors, all of his magicians, astrologers, his, his uh, sorcerers, his enchanters. And the story or the decree comes to Daniel and his three friends. And they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, Daniel, as we've already said, had gone through the schooling of the Babylonians. And so he was apparently numbered with the wise men. He was numbered with those that were being killed. As the story unfolds, one of the king's guards arrives at Daniel's house for the purpose of executing him. That must have been awkward, right? Knock, knock, knock. Hello, what can I do for you? Daniel? Yes, I'm here to kill you. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? What's going on here? Why all the haste? Why all of the urgency? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. He must have said something like, well, listen, the king's had a dream. 
He can't remember the dream, but he knows it's important. He has an anxiety associated with this dream. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Instead of fearing for their lives, they decide to have a prayer time together. And Daniel asks, and his friends ask, that the Lord would give them not only the interpretation of the dream, but the dream as well. And so the first word of verse 19, then the secret was revealed. What do you mean then? Well, after he prayed, after he asked. So Daniel at this point is rushed into the presence of the king. And then Daniel explains to the king the dream. It's interesting, though, what Daniel says at the beginning. He says to the king, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about it. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. I can just imagine when Daniel came in and the king said with surprise, can you tell me the content of my dream? And Daniel said, I cannot tell you the dream because of my wisdom, but there's a God who reveals secrets. And the king was listening because that sounds good, but he hadn't heard the content of the dream yet. Because remember, the king doesn't recall the dream. But you can be sure that if he starts to hear it, you know how that is when you can't quite remember something and someone says, oh, is it, is it this, is it this? Oh, yeah, 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 that's it. Okay, so he's waiting with bated breath. What will the dream be? And then Daniel said, oh, king. Yes, the king said, that's right, I'm king. Oh, king, you looked and saw. Yes, I saw. Now, what did I see? I can just see the king leaning forward in his chair. And then Daniel says, oh, king, you saw an image. And as soon as Daniel had uttered that one word, image, he had won the day. Verse 31, you, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold and its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So here he describes a great metal man, okay? the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and the feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Okay, very simple, a statue, an image, an idol. So you see descending value in terms of the metals, but perhaps increasing strength except for the iron and clay at the bottom. So it's a very intriguing dream, and the context of Daniel suggests that in the sixth century, Daniel was shown a vision of the entire future of the world from Nebuchadnezzar's time until this stone kingdom, which seems to be something that happens at the very end of Earth's history. But he goes on to explain not only what the king dreamed, this image with a head of gold and arms and chest of silver and thighs of brass and bronze and legs of iron and feet of iron mixed with clay, but he goes on to tell the king what those things represent. Verse 37, you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and he has made you ruler over them all. Now look at these words here. You are this head of gold. Okay? No need to wonder. No need to question. No need to guess. Daniel says it. You, Nebuchadnezzar, and by extension, the kingdom that you represent, Babylon, you are this head of gold. Uh, after, of course, consulting his own god, he's told that these metals represent a sequence of various kingdoms. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that you, O king, are this head of gold. The head of gold represents Babylon. And that's very appropriate that that be the symbol for Babylon, which was gilded in gold, famous for its gold. Babylon was one of the most spectacular cities of the ancient world. If you look at the size of Babylon, it was larger than Rome, 
larger than Athens. It was just an enormous city that was situated just about 25 miles south of Baghdad in modern Iraq. Historians tell us that there was more gold in Babylon, and probably they're using hyperbole, but you can get a feel for the richness of ancient Babylon, that there was more gold in Babylon than there was dust. It was the great golden kingdom of antiquity. Excavations that have taken place there beginning in 1899 by the Germans have revealed a city that was surrounded by triple walls. The walls of Babylon consisted of actually two systems of walls. And they surrounded the city, and these two systems, each one consisted of three separate walls. So you had a total of six walls surrounding the whole city. It was massive. This brick is actually a brick from the walls of Babylon. Every brick made during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar was stamped with his name in it. There were over 200 pagan temples. The famous ziggurat, of course, was the central uh, temple. Uh, and many gods were worshipped. Nebuchadnezzar built many altars, temples, sanctuaries. Um, and it was a very polytheistic society, a very sophisticated society. The literature and the language was something that at that time, the Akkadian language was basically the lingua franca of the world, like English is today. Anyone doing commerce, anyone doing any kind of diplomatic relations would be communicating in that language. And so the Babylonian Empire not only spread, but it was very influential as well. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like the idea that he was only the head of gold. He wanted to be the whole thing. And so he set up a great image of gold where the whole thing was of gold in Daniel chapter 3, the very next chapter, and he had a lot of his people bow down and worship. Now, William Shea has pointed out that this was possibly a time of conflict in the empire when there was some uh, possible disloyalty to Nebuchadnezzar going on, so he was having everyone pledge loyalty to him. When you read the document coming from Babylon, we discover that in about 10th year of his reign, a rebellion broke out. And rebellion was so severe at one point in his court that the text says that he had to take his own sword and defend his own life. Fortunately, soldiers came in and he was able to survive this rebellion. And of course, those involved were punished, executed. But the problem was Nebuchadnezzar did not know who else was involved in this rebellion, in this, in this, in this plot. So he is asking that court officials would pledge new allegiance to him. And he is bringing the people into the Babylon just to make sure that they understand that they have to be obedient to him, they have to accept him as sovereign king and ruler. Now this comes very, very close to the events of chapter 3, where we do have the statue he built and people who were there were supposed to bow down and pay respect. We have a list on the tablet mentioning about 100 names of the people who were invited to Babylon to pledge this new allegiance. And among these names, there are three names which are very similar to those three young men that we read in the Bible, in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, they did not bow down. Sedrach, Meshach and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were uh, nobility. They were friends of Daniel. They were part of the upper elite society of Jerusalem. And all uh, three of them with Daniel were taken as captives to uh, be trained in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Those who don't bow down, which are the friends of Daniel, he has them thrown into a, a fiery furnace and heated up very hot. It's like a brick kiln. And just nobody could survive anywhere near it. In fact, the people that threw them in were killed. But the fact that the whole image is of gold really shows that Nebuchadnezzar is rebelling against the vision of Daniel chapter 2. He's not accepting that God is just allowing him to be the head of gold. He wants to be the whole thing and go to the end and reign forever. And so he has some hard lessons to learn. Because in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, Babylon is not a temporary kingdom. Babylon is the apex of all kingdoms. It is the unending kingdom. And so Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. 
Nebuchadnezzar must have loved that. But he didn't love what came next. Take a look at verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then a third kingdom of bronze which shall bear rule over all the earth. Nebuchadnezzar was listening to that and probably didn't like it, but he heard in Daniel chapter 2, 39, that after you, that's after you, Nebuchadnezzar, after the Babylonian kingdom, another kingdom will come. Now, I'm sure that Nebuchadnezzar did not like those two words there, after you. But Daniel says, after you, another kingdom will arise, and then a third kingdom of bronze. So now you get a feel for what the interpretation of the dream is. The gold represents Babylon. After that, the silver represents another kingdom, and then a third kingdom of bronze, and then that critical phrase there, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now here's a critical thing to understand. That phrase, which shall bear rule over all the earth, lets you know that these are not mere regional or tribal powers. These are world-ruling entities, world-ruling powers. Babylon was the greatest nation of antiquity up to that point. But Babylon would be succeeded by another kingdom. Well, the conquest of Babylon is rather interesting. The Persians come up to the city and they surround the city. Of course, from the book of Daniel's perspective, Belshazzar the king is trapped in there with his uh, nobility. And they feel quite safe. The walls of Babylon were very sturdy, very strong. Belshazzar knows that Cyrus is invading, that he's approaching, but he's not afraid. Babylon is invincible. It's got the walls around the city, it's got canals, it's got moats, and it's safe. One of the key features of the city of Babylon was that the Euphrates River ran through uh, the city. That was a source of water uh, for the inhabitants of the city, and you couldn't just break into the city. The gates were very well constructed, and the river itself, there were uh, special barred gates that came down into the river, making it impossible for anyone to sneak into the city through the river course. And Babylon, in fact, was uh, under the rule of, of Belshazzar when it fell, on the night that it fell, according to Daniel chapter 5, when the armies of Cyrus under this general came and they got into the walls, and uh, the Greek historian refers to the idea that, in fact, the armies of Cyrus diverted the waters of the river Euphrates uh, the Persians were able to divert the water by building a canal uh, upstream and diverting the course of the river so that the water level going through the city actually dropped very low and the Persian soldiers were able to slip underneath the water. La última fiesta de Belsasar. Los persas logran entrar y abren todas las puertas de la ciudad. Seguidos por las tropas que han invadido la ciudad. Belsasar recibe informe que otras ciudades han sido derrotadas. Celebra porque se siente seguro. Es lo que muchos creen. Celebra para olvidar que está a punto de ser derribado. Es lo que otros creen. En todo caso, saca los hermosos utensilios y copas del santuario de Israel estaban guardados, tomados del templo de Salomón, y celebran, y se embotan. Pero luego ven una escritura en la pared. Balsasar es aterrorizado y manda a llamar a Daniel. Daniel da la interpretación a unas cuantas horas de la derrota de Babilonia. Babilonia fue un gran imperio, mas no el último. Y el reino siguiente es derribado y seguido por otro. Cada metal representa un reino subsiguiente. Babilonia es conquistada por Medopersia, representada por la plata, el pecho y los brazos. Y Daniel 8 llama a Medopersia por nombre. Ciro, ahora rey de Persia, con su general Ubaru Cobrias, reina desde el 539. 
Los persas eran avanzados y en cierta forma eran gobernadores simpáticos. Aunque Ciro no era incapaz de brutalidad, manda quemar ciudades enteras que no quieren rendirse. Por otro lado, trata muy bien a las ciudades que se someten. Libera a muchos cautivos, incluyendo los judíos de Judá. Devuelve los ídolos a sus templos y cosas por el estilo. El reino persa se extiende y cuando un rey disfruta de poder y ejércitos, Busca agrandar su reino, uno de estos reyes, Cerces, quinto siglo antes de Cristo. El mismo rey que en el libro de Esther es llamado Azuero. Su nombre es difícil de pronunciar, para nosotros es Azuero. En griego es Azuero. Fue el esposo de la reina Esther. La doncella Esther vive en tiempos persas, los días de Cerces. Ese rey que en la Biblia se casa con la jovencita judía, Azuero. Aunque no sabemos si Esther le decía a Cerces o Azuero, así se llama. Es un hombre que codicia el poder, un hombre impetuoso y extravagante. Deseaba conquistar a Grecia. Invade a Grecia, acrecenta el imperio persa. Era el hijo de Darío. Establece ciudades capitales y sus palacios. Su padre las ha cimentado, pero Azuero las termina, como Susa y Persiópolis, y otras ciudades fabulosas del imperio de los persas. Los griegos nunca olvidaron lo que los persas le hicieron. Y un siglo después, se levanta Alejandro Magno, hijo de Felipe de Macedonia, Macedonia queda al norte de Grecia. Alejandro reina en Grecia. Los griegos y los macedonios nunca olvidaron y querían venganza. Se aliaron bajo Alejandro Magno y él derrota al gran ejército persa. Los derrota en tres dramáticos encuentros en Isis, Granicus y Arbela en los 330. Captura a Darío III, el último rey persa. Los griegos y los persas se tenían odio desde tiempo atrás. Los persas siempre quisieron invadir a Grecia y hubo batallas. Alejandro Magno logra hacer alto a las incursiones persas. Y en la batalla final que derrota a Darío III y destruye el ejército persa. Alejandro Magno en la batalla de Arbela en el 331, una grandiosa batalla, donde derrota a los persas con un ejército mínimo. Alejandro levanta una infantería y caballería de 49.000 hombres. Se cree que Darío lo mejoraba de 10 contra 1. 500 mil hombres hasta un millón. Iba muy desventajado para la batalla, pero desarrolla unas excelentes maniobras como el Phalanx y otras que su padre empleaba con mucho éxito. La batalla intensifica tanto que Darío da vuelta y se da la fuga. Y no era la primera vez. Quizás si hubiera sido otro rey en otra época. Algunos eruditos apuntan al verso bíblico donde Dios infunde terror a los corazones de reyes. Quizás fue uno de esos periodos y Dios ya había decidido que surgiera otro reino. Sea como fuere, Alejandro gana cuando debió haber perdido. Ahora hay una transición de Babilonia a Medo-Persia, a un tercer reino que ha de dominar a todo el mundo. Hemos llegado a los muslos de bronce, el imperio greco. Este reino es nombrado por nombre en Daniel 8, Grecia. Como dice en la Biblia, Grecia. ¿Ok? Así que, Babilonia, entonces Medo-Persa y entonces Grecia. 
Es decir, que no nos da lugar a interpretación, los nombra. Tenemos un ancla histórica. Daniel emplea estos símbolos, sean animales o metales de una imagen, para apuntar a una serie de imperios que surgen y dominan en el Medio Oriente y en los territorios del pueblo de Dios. Grecia queda perfectamente descrita como el poder que sigue a los persas. Exactamente lo que Daniel ve, una sucesión de imperios. Aunque Alejandro era preciso, poderoso, y recibió tutela del filósofo griego más renombrado, el mismo Aristóteles. Lamentablemente Alejandro, aunque potente para derrotar y ascender sobre el mundo, no pudo vencerse a sí mismo. Conquista el mundo, mas no sus inquietudes, y muere en Babilonia sin heredero al trono. Cuatro de sus generales se apoderan, Casandro, Lisímaco, Tolemio y Seleuco. Ellos se dividen el imperio en partes iguales, cumpliendo la profecía de Daniel 8. Así que, Babilonia, luego Medopersia y Grecia. Veamos los detalles del cuarto imperio. Muy interesante, verso 40. El cuarto reino será fuerte como el hierro. Y como el hierro desmenuza y quebranta todas las cosas, este quebrantará a los demás. Dedica más espacio a este reino que a ninguno de los otros. Y dice que es desmedidamente grandioso, fuerte y poderoso. Simbolizado por hierro, quebranta a los que le previnieron y los desmenuza. Este reino no es sino la gran monarquía de hierro de Roma. Solo Roma lo llena. La República Romana se convierte en el Imperio Romano y llega a ser el más grande de la serie de reinos sucesivos. Es el más fuerte. Daniel lo despunta como hierro y ciertamente en cuanto a fuerza bruta. Las riquezas y gloria de Roma no mejoran a Babilonia, Medopersia o Grecia, mas en cuanto a fuerza bruta, mejora mucho a los previos y le queda bien el hierro. Roma es conocido como un imperio militar, conocido por sus ejércitos, disciplinados por su perseverancia, por su desplazamiento en la batalla, conocidos por su furia, por su fuerza, por poder y una cultura refinada. Cristo vive durante el imperio romano, ¿no es así? Cristo fue clavado en una cruz romana, custodiado bajo soldados romanos. Comparece ante el gobernador romano Poncio Pilato. La crucifixión y los métodos que ésta encierra muestran el poder romano y la caracterización bíblica como el imperio de hierro. Vemos pues las piernas de hierro, Roma, que no llega a ser conquistada. Roma no fue conquistada por un poder militar opositor más fuerte y potente. Roma se dividió. Me pregunto, ¿qué dice la profecía? Vamos a ver lo que dice. Verso 41. Lo que viste de los pies y los dedos de hierro y barro cocido. Miren estas cinco palabras. Marquen estas palabras. Será un reino dividido. ¿Será qué? Dividido. Será dividido. Es decir, no hay nada de conquistar este cuarto imperio. Se desintegra. El reino será dividido. En su fase final ya no es un imperio, sino una desintegración. Hay hierro y barro cocido que no mezclan. La desintegración del imperio. Verso 41 dice, lo que viste en parte hierro y parte barro será un reino dividido. 
habrá en él algo de la fuerza del hierro, como viste hierro junto al barro. Es decir, el hierro sigue pero queda dividido. Es precisamente lo que sucedió al imperio romano cuando se transformó de imperio a una Europa dividida. Desde temprano vemos la llegada de tribus bárbaras que causan estragos. Y al pasar el tiempo, Roma pierde, pierde su vigor. De Roma sale un imperio dividido que es en parte como hierro y en parte barro. No mezclan ni se pegan. Sostienen simulacro de unión, pero no están unidos. Hombres feroces han intentado unir a Europa, pero la Escritura dice que no será. Han habido atentados. Daniel indica competencia entre las partes de hierro y de barro. Es interesante ver la desintegración del Santo Imperio Romano y, y de momento surgen... Surgen países fuertes como los francos, Carlomagno. En la Edad Media surgen reinos. Reinos a relucir, pero ninguno puede mantenerse en poder. Y tal ha sido la historia de Roma desde la des desintegración del Santo Imperio Romano, de la Edad Media hasta el día de hoy. Napoleón es un buen ejemplar de un líder que intenta reunificar a Europa al modo de Roma, Grecia, Medopersia y Babilonia, pero no lo logra. Las otras piezas de hierro y de barro se le oponen y destruyen el imperio francés. La profecía se confirma en la historia. Roma no fue conquistada, sino desintegrada. Y luego algo interesante. Dice que se mezclan en la semilla humana. Una frase singular y difícil, pero es fácil. Significa que intentan unir las partes de Europa por los lazos nupciales artificiales intentan unirse por casamiento y eso es precisamente lo que revela la historia de Europa precisamente lo que Daniel predijo y se cumple varios siglos después de Daniel algo increíble Una de las más destacadas practicantes de esto fue María Teresa. En los 1700, época de Mozart, reina del imperio austrohúngaro, tuvo varias hijas y las casa a príncipes europeos de su escoger. Su hija favorita pudo escoger su príncipe. Así intentaron unir a Europa. El rey, príncipe o duque de este reino con la reina, princesa o duquesa de aquel, todo con el propósito de unir con familias a las naciones de Europa. Para que Roma fuese nuevamente integrada. Pero el texto dice que no se pegan. Intentan unirse por matrimonio, pero no funciona porque la profecía es segura. El imperio no se reará, no importa lo que intenten los hombres. El incrédulo dice, es demasiado preciso, seguro que fue escrito después de los hechos. Todos están de acuerdo que la profecía de Daniel acierta. La pregunta es... ¿Fue escrito cinco a seis siglos antes de Cristo, como se asevera? ¿O fue escrito después de la desintegración de Roma cinco a seis siglos después de Cristo? Esa es la pregunta. Desde el punto de vista arqueológico, tenemos mucha evidencia nueva. Y reciente que apoya la historicidad y fidelidad del libro de Daniel. 
¿Cómo podemos saber cuándo el libro de Daniel fue escrito? El descubrimiento de los pergaminos del Mar Muerto del 1947 lo confirman. En esos pergaminos de una antigua comunidad religiosa está cada libro del Antiguo Testamento. Junto con porciones de libros, con la excepción del libro de Esther. Espera, están todos menos Esther. ¿Cuál libro está ahí? Daniel. Los pergaminos incluyen el libro de Daniel como canónico, perteneciente a las Escrituras. Si el libro fue escrito en el siglo II, como algunos dicen, ¿cómo es canónico a una época tan temprana? Pensémoslo bien. Aún eruditos seculares fechan los pergaminos entre el 250 y 50 antes de Cristo. Es decir, de medio a casi tres siglos antes de Cristo. ¿Rastrean? Si fechan así, ¿qué creen? nos confirma que la fecha atribuida al libro de Daniel o sea, cinco a seis siglos antes de Cristo es verdadera en lugar de ser una obra tardía, errónea no histórica e incierta es todo lo contrario. Hay suficiente evidencia para establecer una fecha de cinco siglos antes de Cristo, confirmando el material. Vamos a ver lo que sigue. Verso 34. Viste una piedra cortada no con mano, la cual hiere a la imagen en sus pies de hierro y barro y los esmenuza. Y el barro, el hierro, bronce, plata y el oro fueron como tamo de las eras de verano. El viento se los llevó sin dejarles rastro y la piedra se hizo un monte que cubrió la tierra. Nabucodonosor creía que Dios vive en los montes. Vemos que Dios se vale de esta idea. Le muestra una roca que sale del monte y es arrojada para destruir la imagen. Para que el rey supiese que no se trataba de otro reino mundial igual. sino algo que proviene directamente del reino de Dios. En tal contexto, una roca cortada no con mano humana, no es de hombres, es de Dios. Algo divino que destruye los reinos mundiales y dura para siempre sin fin. Veamos en 1 Corintios 10, 4, ¿Quién es la roca y el monte que llena al mundo? La roca que los seguía era Cristo Dios. Qué interesante. Y en Deuteronomio 33, 3 y 4, Dios se llama a sí mismo la roca. Ve salir una roca voladora que destruye la imagen. Esto es Cristo, la segunda venida. Le está diciendo, el reino de Dios viene a interrumpir la historia humana para deshacer todo reino mundial y su reino es mundial y dura para siempre. Recuerden que el libro de Daniel existe desde cinco siglos antes de Cristo. Increíble, cinco siglos. Ustedes no saben qué vendrá en cinco segundos, mucho menos cinco siglos. Daniel escribe desde Babilonia, predice, si dividimos la profecía, siete secciones. Profetiza Babilonia, es una. Profetiza Medopersia, son dos. Nombra a Grecia y hubo Grecia, tres. Nombra a Roma y fue Roma, son cuatro. 
dice que Roma se divide, van cinco, que pese a los esfuerzos por unirla queda dividida, son seis. Lo único que falta es la roca que hiere y el reino divino que nunca será destruido. El comandante piensa un momento, quita su sombrero y lo pone en el escritorio y mi abuelo lo imita. Mi abuelo saca una Biblia de su bolsillo y cuenta la historia de Nabucodonosor. Una imagen con cabeza de oro, pecho y brazos de plata, muslos de bronce, piernas de hierro y pies de hierro y barro. Repasa los imperios mundiales representados, Babilonia, Medopersia, Grecia y Roma. Le dice que estamos viviendo en los días de la Europa dividida, la Roma despedazada, de los pies de hierro con barro cocido. Este es el tiempo en el cual actualmente vivimos. Por lo cual no creo que Hitler tenga razón. Su imperio no puede durar 10 siglos como lo asevera. Esta guerra la vamos a perder porque la profecía nunca falla. El comandante piensa un momento. Y dijo, préstame tu Biblia. Quiero que te reportes en 24 horas a las 9 de la mañana. Estás despedido. Y dice... Préstame tu Biblia. Quiero que te reportes en 24 horas a las 9 de la mañana. Estás despedido. Al día siguiente el comandante está flanqueado por otros comandantes. Mi abuelo se cree traicionado. Pero el comandante se quita el sombrero y pide a sus colegas que hagan igual y que no se repetirá lo dicho. Entrega la Biblia a mi abuelo y le pide que repita el estudio. Mi abuelo abre en Daniel 2 y comienza. Repasa las fechas de los metales de la imagen y ve que cada vez que menciona, cada vez que mencione una de las fechas como 605 al 539, su comandante y los otros oficiales se echan reojo. Concluye el estudio y reitera que Hitler no va a ganar porque la profecía dice que Roma no vuelve a pegarse. Al terminar el estudio, el aula queda en perfecto silencio. Es despedido, mas el comandante le presenta a sus colegas. Este es un capitán que era profesor de historia. Y este otro caballero también fue profesor de historia en su carrera de civil. Los dos corroboran las fechas y la secuencia de los imperios. Muchas, muchas gracias por la presentación. Dos meses después, en mayo de 1945, la guerra dio final y encarados con el desafío de volver a Alemania y abandonar lo que les había costado varios meses lograr, se preguntaban cómo iban a regresar. Pero el comandante se había convencido e hizo una reserva de gasolina y comestibles sin que mi abuelo lo supiera. Porque el comandante supo en base a Daniel II que tendrían que darse a la fuga. A contarme esta historia mucho tiempo después y se ha publicado un libro titulado Caerán a tu lado mil. De los 1200 hombres que formaban su unidad, solo siete sobrevivieron. Algo maravilloso, siendo que mi abuelo estaba convencido de no portar armas. Portaba una pistola de madera que hizo estando en Francia al inicio de la guerra. Y durante la guerra nadie supo que mi abuelo no iba armado. Siempre dijo que creyó con todo su corazón que Dios estuvo con él y le dio su protección. Y que Dios le dio tales oportunidades de testificar de la palabra de Dios y de las profecías que cambiaron su vida y la de su familia y le salvaron la vida. Antes de conocer Daniel 2, 7 y otras profecías, 
yo no tenía el más mínimo interés en la religión. Nada. Conocer esta profecía fue un evento determinativo en mi aceptación de Cristo y su Biblia. A mi ver, hay dos aspectos de la Biblia que la hacen un libro único y viviente hoy en día. Primero son las profecías que se pueden confirmar en el transcurso de la historia. Dos, al hacer excavaciones arqueológicas hallamos civilizaciones de las antigüedades de la Biblia. Ya sea Babilonia, Medopersia, Roma o Grecia. Con nuestras manos palpamos el pasado y lo presenciamos en sus tres dimensiones. Algo que hace de la Biblia un libro real en una manera muy poderosa. Todos estos detalles nos declaran que una mente divina puede ver el futuro. Isaías 46, 9 y 10, yo soy Dios y no hay otro. Dice, yo soy Dios y luego nos presenta las evidencias. ¿Qué evidencia presenta de que es Dios? Declarando desde el principio cosas aún no cumplidas. Profecías.